Good day. Good day, World CF students. Today, once again, we're talking about imperialism, a lot of part of the 19th century in Asia. But before we talk about that, um, you know, and yes, uh, you've probably seen these two videos here on the Boxer Rebellion and perhaps the modernization of Japan. Um, we're going to look at some political cartoons because uh, political cartoons are important. It's a good way to quickly uh, understand what was going on. And I like them. So, yeah. And so, yes, let's go here and let's go down here. Uh, political. Yes, let us begin with this one. Now, remember, all these cartoons that I'm about to show you uh, indicate the fact that European countries were basically moving into taking over, colonizing, and exploiting uh, the countries of Asia, in particular China. In this cartoon, we see there are three figures, a lion, an eagle, and this person here. Well, obviously, this person, because of the way he's dressed, and the racist nature of the drawing of the eyes uh, represents China, uh, who, as you see, is kind of uh, helpless in this picture. Now, these two creatures represent, this represents England. The lion traditionally represents England in cartoons or John Bull. And this eagle represents Germany. There are many countries that use the eagle. Uh, as a representative creature, including our own Austria, Poland. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yes, and uh, yeah, that's Germany. So, and the point of this cartoon, though, is, you know, is not just that these countries were victimizing China, but that these two countries, notice their eyes are not on China, they're on each other like two predators, you know, uh, about to, you know, to try to um, keep a carcass for themselves. Okay, let's push on, shall we? This is another one. Now here, once again, you have uh, three creatures. The lion's back. He represents, of course, England. The bear is the symbol of Russia. This guy in the middle, although it doesn't really tell you, represents Afghanistan, uh, a country to the south of Russia. And this country, in what was called the Great Game, this country was victimized uh, by both uh, the, uh, England, the UK, Great Britain, and Russia. And notice the caption, Save Me From My Friends. Uh, this was probably an American cartoon. May it might have been an English cartoon, well, because it's written in English, uh, and it's kind of uh, uh, kind of critical of the uh, the British. And so, yeah, you wouldn't expect it to be a British cartoon, but yeah, um, Afghanistan, England, Russia. It's, this one actually deals more with the build-up to war, uh, World War I. We'll look at it later. Now, this one, again, is about imperialism. Now, of course, if you look, the territory this gentleman is standing on uh, is Africa. The gentleman is a guy named Cecil Rhodes. And Cecil Rhodes was a big imperialist, uh, what they call a jingoist. You say, what's a jingoist? A jingoist was a type of person in England who was very much in favor of England exploiting the rest of the world. Pardon me. Too late, Horton. Uh, England exploiting the rest of the world for its own gain. Uh, now, and his big statement was that he thought that England should own a string of colonies stretching from Cape Town, which is South Africa here, to Cairo, 
which is in Egypt up here. Now you're saying, what's this wire here? Uh, telegraph. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's a cartoon publicizing British imperialism, maybe even encouraging it. Uh, yeah. And so this, this is another cartoon depicting British imperialism. Uh, here's John Bull, although it's depicted, he normally doesn't wear this. Uh, but you can see victimizing India on the one hand and Ireland on the other. Uh, you know, imperialism. And this is, I, I really like this cartoon because here you see uh, England again, Russia again. Uh, notice they label all the countries. This is Germany. This is Italy. This double-headed eagle is Austria. This is Japan. I don't know why Japan is depicted as a leopard, but you know, whatever. And yes, even the United States standing off in the background and just kind of watching. But this cartoon, by the same token, depicts all of these countries hoping, and that's France, by the way, hoping to get a slice of this giant dragon carcass, which represents China. Yeah, once again, racial insensi insen racial sensitivity was not really a hallmark of publications, media, newspaper back then. So yeah, this represents China and all these countries want a slice. Uh, and that's what the theme of this cartoon is. Okay, this is another cartoon depicting European imperialism in China. The pizza here represents aforementioned China. This person here is the emperor, the Chinese uh, Jing emperor. And these people around here, this is Queen Victoria. This, because of the helmet, is Queen Victoria of Great Britain. This is the Kaiser, Kaiser Wilhelm I of Germany, or the second. Uh, this is the Russian Tsar. This is the Japanese, young Japanese emperor, samurai sword, top knot. I mean, they're all caricatures. And this woman here is France. In French uh, media, uh, cartoons, France is often depicted as a woman. And by the way, that woman, her name is Liberty. Yeah, the French uh, idea of Liberty is that Liberty is a woman, like the Statue of Liberty, which, remember, the Statue of Liberty, which stands in New York Harbor, was originally a gift from France. Yeah. Nope, nope. Nope. Uh, this is an imperialist cartoon uh, from World War II, actually. Basically, it's a Japanese cartoon that they sent to the people of India, uh, reminding them of the fact that the British exploited Indian people. Um, boom, boom. Now, this also is an imperialist cartoon because basically what you have here North America and Europe have basically emptied Central America, South America, and Africa of their resources, and they possess them. This also is an imperialist cartoon. In this cartoon, it's about American imperialism. Uh, notice it's uh, basically, let's go blow that up, shall we? Notice this canon represents the Monroe Doctrine. And this person here is representing uh, the crown heads of Europe. And this person represents the Dominican Republic. And notice that uh, the crown heads of Europe are trying to get their mitts on the Monroe Doctrine. And here we see the President of the United States, Teddy Roosevelt, you know, staring down and, you know, the crown heads and basically with the threat, you know, this is our 
hemisphere. Okay, and yeah. Not that. I think finished. Yes, we are. Okay. Thank you for that. So, uh, getting back to the matter hand, now let's begin talking about imperialism in China. China at the time was ruled by the Empress Dowager Zizi. 1962-1908. Uh, she was not the last emperor member of the Jing dynasty. She was the second last. The last Manchu or Jing ruler was a guy named Puyi. Anyway, um, and while she did accept some reforms, the so-called self-strengthening movement, she updated China's educational system, diplomatic service, and military. She also set up factories to manufacture steam, gunboats, rifles, and ammunition. However, many foreigner, foreign powers had exploited China's problems, the European ones. Russia, from Russia, Britain, France, Germany. Oh, yes, yeah, sphere of influence. Sphere of influence was, once again, the idea that within a certain area, one country would be dominant. Uh, for example, within Great Britain's sphere of influence, and they had several spheres of influence in uh, China, uh, the British would be the most favored nation. They would be the ones who the only ones who could trade within that particular sphere. Now, the United States, on the other hand, uh, once again referring back to that cartoon we looked at, the United States actually, in China, the United States actually played the good guy. Uh, the United States policy in China was basically, hey guys, look, you know, there's no need to quarrel over who gets to trade in China. Why don't we all trade in China? And why don't the person, country that has the best deal be the one that's allowed to buy and sell things in China. And that was called the open door policy. Uh, so, the Chinese press for strong reforms, led by Guangzhou, who was assassinated, the, uh, the emperor of China, Guangzhou, was assassinated because he wanted to cut off his queue. Now, the queue, what's a queue? Well, go back to the cartoons. The Q that is the Q. In China, men traditionally wore Qs that they never cut. Uh, in fact, their Qs would uh, they when they were small boys, they would shave the head of the boy back to here and that hair which would be braided would then be allowed to grow for the young male's entire life. Some cues actually reached the ground and they had to reach it up and tie it in the back so that it wouldn't drag the ground and be totally nasty. Uh, and so yeah that's a cue. And so yeah he was assassinated because uh, the emperor before the emperor Shiji uh, Da the Empress Dowager Gigi was, he was executed, or not executed, he was assassinated because he wanted to cut off his queue. However, his successor, the Empress Dowager Gigi, was recalled to the throne and the reforms of the Guangzhou were brought to naught. The Boxer Rebellion. Yeah, the Boxer Rebellion. The Boxer Rebellion was, uh, sprang from the fact that more and more and more Chinese particularly Chinese young males, uh, who call themselves the Fist of Universal Harmony, the Society of Harmonious Fist. Uh, in the West, they simply were called the Boxers because of the main fist. Uh, these people did not like Western influence, did not like Western exploitation, really didn't like Christianity as a symbol of exploitation, and so they decided to do something about it. And so basically, what they did, they began going around China, killing every foreigner they get their hands on. And what the foreigners did, who the ones who lived in Peking, or it's called Beijing now, um, they took refuge in the biggest uh, embassy 
and the most well defended embassy in all of China, which was the British embassy in uh, Beijing, Peking. And um, she, and so I don't know if you've ever been to an embassy or not. I am not myself. But every country has an embassy in every other country in the world. For example, there's a street in Washington, D.C. called Embassy Row. And there you have one embassy after another, representing the foreign countries that the United States deals with. Normally, these embassies have walled compounds, like a small fortress, and the embassy grounds itself is like foreign territory. I mean, for example, American police, nor American military, uh, nor anybody that really wants to, unless they're part of the embassy, uh, can simply just go into the um, into that country's embassy. I actually have a uh, I have a niece who lives in Colombia in Bogota, and she works for the American embassy. And she goes uh, into the American embassy, and she is paid by the United States government. But she works for the American embassy. She is Colombian. She's a Colombian national. And so, yeah, it's an interesting thing. I'm very proud of her. But the point of the matter is, within that American compound, that's American territory. Uh, they observe American holidays, for example. Uh, so, um, these Westerners, getting back to the Boxer Rebellion, these Westerners uh, sought out the biggest and most well-defended of all the embassy compounds. And by the way, embassies, they do have normally have soldiers. In fact, Marines guard American embassies. But all around the world, those uh, embassies are only guarded by soldiers with sidearms, with 9 millimeter pistols. Uh, maybe a few... Uh, maybe a few rifles, but in other words, they're, they're not there seriously thinking that if they were attacked that they could put up a good defense. There weren't enough, there aren't enough of them, there weren't enough of them back then, but all of the foreign embassies in Beijing, all of their foreigners, all of their soldiers took refuge in the British embassy because it... Um, it had the best, the highest walls, basically, and the most easily defended. And so for, as it says there, 51 days, 51 days, uh, this hodgepodge grouping of all these soldiers, American soldiers, uh, British soldiers, of course, German, Italian, Japanese, uh, they all, you know, hold up in this embassy, and for 51 days, held off these boxers, and these boxers numbered in the thousands, you know, because, and had the boxers been able to breach that embassy and get in, in there, uh, they would have torn those Westerners apart. Oh, they'd killed them all, slaughtered them, uh, the foreign devils, as they call them. And for 51 days, they held out. And just on that 51st day, when the soldiers guarding the embassy walls were basically about to run out of ammunition, um, a contingent of German, American, and Japanese soldiers had marched over from the coast, from the Pacific coast, and uh, came and saved them. It's an it's a, it's a, I mean, and it was literally on the last day. I mean, it's an interesting story, and yes, it was made into a movie. What is most interesting about it was that, you know, for all the, uh, I don't want to call it trash, but for all the movies where Hollywood takes history and kind of bends the truth, this one was the truth. And what's most interesting about it, they wrote up the screenplay, they wrote up the storyline, and the guy that wrote it began shopping it around Hollywood, saying, you know, I got this idea for a movie, uh, blah, 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 you know, it'll be a great story. And just about everybody in Hollywood read the screenplay, read the script, and went, nah, we don't want it. Uh, why not? Well, nobody ever believed it that they showed up on the last day. What is ironic about it, that is, is that 
they did. Most, you know, and you know, in history, most of the time, in reality, most of the time, um, the good guys, the cavalry, they show up either well before the crisis point or, you know, after the crisis is passed and everybody in the fort gets slaughtered. Either they show up way too early or they show up too late. Well, here they showed up literally just in the next time. I was like, no, we don't, we don't want to produce that story. Eventually, somebody did, but yeah. How did the Empress Dowager's reaction to spreading her government? Well, it was found out that she kind of secretly encouraged the boxers. And because of that, the foreign powers were very unhappy with China. Very unhappy. Uh, the Empress Dowager kind of limped through her last years uh, on the throne. She... Uh, died in 1908 and the last emperor of china was a child who became emperor when he was three years old and in 1908 and he uh, eventually abdicated the throne in 1917 and that was puyi 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 was his name the last emperor of china now, let's switch from China and talk about Japan. Now, Japan and China uh, took opposite directions when faced by Europeans. The Japanese, as it says here, Japan reacted to Western influence in a much different manner than the Japanese. The Chinese had re rejected the Westerners in it as inferior, but they couldn't keep them out of the country. And the Westerners, Westerners the British, the French, Portuguese kind of crept in like a fungus infecting China. Japan, on the other hand, kicked all foreigners out of their country uh, in the 15th century and on pain of death. For several centuries, the Japanese had kept all foreigners out of their country. Saying, so what does that mean, pain of death? Well, the Japanese decreed that any foreign sailor who had the uh, mishap of washing up on the shores of Japan, he could look forward to being either beheaded right there if he was lucky, or boiled in oil if he was not. And they did both. Uh, the foreigners who were in Japan, and especially Christian missionaries and Christianity, um, the Japanese expelled them. And Christian Japanese who converted to Christianity um, were crucified. Yeah, they crucified them. Uh, you know, basically trying to be ironic, I guess. Uh, so Japan was ruled for 300 years by the Tokugawa clan, a family of shoguns, warlords, shoguns, who had ruled even though the emperor of Japan was still on the throne. Under this system. The warrior class, the samurai class, was held in very high regard and were supported by the labor of the majority of citizens who were peasants. Sorry. During this time, there was some trade with the Dutch as well as the Chinese, and the Japanese kept diplomatic relations with uh, Korea. That all changed in 1953 when Commodore Matthew Perry, an American uh, Commodore sailed four of his fleet of all white battleships. Now imagine this: to go to Japan, normally ships to this day are painted gray because it helps them kind of uh, fade into the uh, the ocean. But these ships were painted white because they wanted to be seen. So these ships painted white, sailed into Tokyo Harbor, and began launching. Uh, barrage after barrage, bombarding <coughs> the hillsides all around Tokyo. Uh, the Americans then uh, landed a contingent of Marines, and these Marines then got off in Tokyo, brandishing their rifles and ban bayonets, and they forced their way into the Emperor's palace. And once there, you know, everybody thought, well, you know, the Emperor is a dead man. They're going to kill him. Instead, though, of killing him, they began giving him presents. Books, rifles, pistols, eyeglasses, microscopes, maps, 
and other such items with a letter from the United States President Millard Fillmore asking for that the, giant, the Japanese trade with the United States and a veiled threat that they would be back in a year to seal the deal. That deal was Treaty of Kanagawa in 1854. By 1860, the Japanese had opened several ports to foreign countries. In 1867, the Tokugawa, the old shogunate, had stepped down, and the young emperor, Mochihito, uh, had assumed control of Japan. This was called the Meiji Restoration. Now, here is where the Japanese differed from the Chinese in the way they reacted to Western civilization. Instead of ignoring the West and basically hoping they would go away as the Chinese had done, and that blew up in their faces, the Japanese made the decision that they were going to be the West. They were going to copy the West and do exactly what the Westerners did. Because the Japanese understood right away, you know, when Matthew Perry uh, began bombarding the hillsides and forced their way, they got to write to the emperor, the Japanese understood they were horribly outmatched. And so they said, we're going to do what they do. Kind of like, you know, when uh, uh, in the first Avengers movie, uh, actually the first Thor movie, uh, you know, Fury rep uh, understood that uh, the Earth was horribly outmatched. And so they began using uh, one of the seven Infinity Stones. Yeah to build up the defenses of the earth. So, Japanese then sent teams of observers around the world to copy the modern nations and the made things that made them strong. They went to Germany, Germany to copy its strong central government and its army. They copied the navy of, guess what? Of course, Great Britain. They copied the industrialization of Germany, France, and Britain. They copied the American public education system. They then built 7,000 miles of railroads from 1872 to 1914. Coal production was rapidly expanded in Japan. Japan did have some coal. And Japan tried to become a major trade shipping power like Britain. And the Japanese also began to look around to build itself a colonial empire. And to build that empire, they copied, of course, the British. Because in 1867, Great Britain owned 25% of the Earth's surface, and the Japanese said, we want to be like them. By 1890, the Japanese had 500,000 well-trained, western-sized style soldiers and several dozen modern steel warships. It, Japan, could now claim top spot as Asia's top military power. Japan then got those cursed extraterritoriality rights abolished, Japan, now attempting to become a Western power, becomes an imperialist nation and attempts to build a colonial empire. Japan wanted to control Korea, but so did China. Each nation, China and Japan, pledged to leave Korea alone, but when China broke the pledge, the Japanese sent their modern army against the Chinese, and the Chinese were just hopelessly outgunned, outmatched, in what was called the Sino-Japanese War of 1895 which the Japanese won in months and was able to make its first, first colonial acquisitions. They took Korea, they took Taiwan, and the Pescadores Islands. Japan then decided to take on a Western power, the Russians. The Russians wanted to gain territory in Manchuria to complete its new railroad, the Trans-Siberian Railroad, which stretched from St. Petersburg in the, the uh, west part of Russia to uh, all the way to the Pacific Ocean in the east. A r railroad, by the way, that took 25 years to build. The Japanese offered the Russians that they would respect their rights in Manchuria if the Russians stay out of Korea. But the Russians said, no, we are not, and you can't make us. And the Japanese beat the crap out of them. Yeah, in a war that lasted 18 months. The so-called Sino-Japanese War. Uh, the Japanese destroyed the Russian Baltic fleet. This defeat by the Japanese was the first major victory of an Eastern power over a Western power since the Middle Ages. Peace negotiations were soon underway, brokered by none other than Teddy Roosevelt uh, and the Treaty of Portsmouth. 
It gave Japan rights to Manchuria, uh, which is part of China. It gave them the southern half of the island of Sakhalin. The Russian government was humiliated by this defeat, and it will be just one more nail in the coffin of the Russian Romanov ruling family. Japan went on then to solidify its hold on Korea. Japanese advisors gradually took control of the Korean government. The Korean king could not muster enough support to fight the Japanese. And the Japanese uh, were very harsh to Koreans. Actually, the Japanese were simply following the example set by the British, who had colonized the rest of the world. I mean, you know, the British, for example, um, the Belgians cutting off people's arms in Congo, the British uh, in India and in Nigeria. And they, the Japanese set up a colonial empire based on the British model. The Japanese taught exclusively in Korean schools. In other words, in Korean schools, the language taught in Korean schools was not Korean, it was Japanese. Imagine children growing up, and the reason the Japanese did that, they wanted to be able to uh, conduct business in Japanese, in their colony. No Korean industry was allowed, and they took all the land from Korean farmers and gave it to Japanese farmers. This became known as the Yellow Peril. Say, what's the Yellow Peril? That was a term that the, uh, the press used to describe Japanese aggressiveness. And I think that that is a good place to end for today, what with watching those videos. Uh, so, um, let us, where are we at, Horton? Um, oh, yeah, let's go here. And let's go here and 